This week's episode is sponsored by SEMGREP. We'll tell you more about our sponsor later, but the reason you're really here is because you want to meet our guest, and that's Brendan Shears. Welcome, Brendan. Hey, awesome. thanks for having me so much. My pleasure. Will you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself before I start asking you a thousand questions? Sure, no, happy to do so. So I'm Brendan Shears, uh, a managing principal over at Synopsys uh, within the Software Integrity Group. Um, I'm responsible these days for our cloud security and emerging technologies, uh, global consulting business. Uh, beforehand, um, and still now, um, I, I, I was responsible for building out our security champions offering and, and the work we do with a lot of our clients on helping them build security champions programs, train developers and champions, and just help kind of with the better interaction between security teams and um, developers. So Brendan and I met on LinkedIn, right? That's where we met. And mm -hmm. basically I was asking people, you know, about their security champions programs and all sorts of stuff. And he messaged me and then we had a Zoom call and I was really, really excited to learn. So I get really pumped up about things. The audience knows that. <laughs> and uh, I'm very, very excited about security champions. And I feel like Brendan is the person who has equaled my enthusiasm. And I was like, oh my gosh, will you please be on my podcast? And he said, yes. And so <laughs> to start off, can you just tell us what the heck is a security champion? What are we talking about here? Yeah, no, happy to do so. I, I mean, I think for me, I mean, it's it, it, it's a lot of different things, but I think really the two ways that I kind of like to articulate or define what a champion is, is, is really um, one, it's, it's just really helping bridge the gap between security and development teams, helping somebody you know, building relationships between the two groups to really help drive each other's mission, right? Development has important things that they need to solve and objectives that further the business, protect the business, qual you know, improve quality, improve features and, and, you know, revenue and all those things. And security has their mission as well, like managing risk. And I think it really helps having a, a relationship between the two groups where you're, you're working together on this, this shared mission. And I think parts of that leading to kind of the second part of how I look at how you define champions is it's really a way to help identify and address process friction. You know, it, oftentimes security teams, you know, hard to get, you know, it's hard to scale. It's, it's you know, there's not enough people on your team to help with all the thousands of, of applications and developers that you're responsible for. And frankly, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's easy at times to kind of toss things over the wall, honestly. And, and if, your developers aren't getting a good experience with it, you know, they're going to push back or they're not going to do it and they're not going to tell you. And I think having a champion in that relationship where it makes it really easy for them and developers to reach out to you because they know you versus the security team at org.com, you know, email address nebulous, you know, really, I think helps, um, you know, helps, helps makes it makes it more simple to solve these problems. So my next question was going to be, why would someone want a security champions program? And I reducing friction in processes. Oh my, I, I can't tell you how many places I've worked where that's the case. So, so we need some building blocks if we are going to try. So we work, let's say we work at a giant enterprise and we want to have less friction. We want all the teams to work better together. Um, what, what will we start with? Like, maybe we would start with goals. Like what kind of goals? Yeah, no, yeah, no, definitely. And, and I think a lot of what I, what I, when I start working uh, with organizations, when we're, we're just in that initial phase of building out a program, you know, I, I like to kind of just get a lay of the land, right? Um, you know, I like to kind of just really start by understanding current state. Like what is currently going on in your organization? Like, let's not think of solutions yet. Let's just get a, you know, let me get up to speed. Let's kind of go through this process and just do some fact finding, right? Um, I'll talk to the security team. Hey, tell me about your process. What do you expect developers to do? How often? What's the change management process? What tools do you have? When do you pen test or code review? And who's responsible for that? We're trying to get that all, you know, out in the open. And then what I'd like to do is have that same conversation with then developer teams. I'll invite the security people. I'll tell the security people, you're not you're not allowed to answer any questions. You're you're there to just soak it in. And I think you know we'll ask the same questions. What are you expected to do? What kind of tools do you use? 
how, do, how well do the tools work? Do you actually get what you want out of those? Is it easy to talk to the security team, the quiet security team person? And, you know, kind of really building out um, like that understanding. And I think that exercise alone really kind of helped because oftentimes the security team would be like, oh, didn't realize that was happening. Or wow, they didn't understand the process and what was expected of them. We have some work to do there. So that kind of undercovers some initial things, but really kind of through that process, trying to understand the deltas, trying to understand where that friction and things aren't really working as well and getting both teams to open up. And then from there, really just trying to hone in on like what the most impactful is. Not trying to take them all down. Let's just figure out the one that, a, excuse me, a people-based solution, like a champion, can really actually help with versus tackling the whole ocean. So since you and I talked last, I went to Toronto to an IANS forum to give some talks and I met someone and he's like, yeah, I'm an AppSec person, and but I was previously a diplomat. And he was explaining how the, and so I feel like you are the diplomat in that case, like perfectly, like kind of between the two sides, not that they're warring, but you're trying to make sure they get along a lot better. Oh. And so, so who's going to run this program? Like who, who would be, who would, who would be in charge of the security champions program or building it? Yeah, no, I, I just kind of want to touch on that last point, though, with the diplomat. I think you're absolutely spot on because, I mean, and obviously they're not warring, but let's be honest here. There's diff there's sometimes different priorities for both groups. They're not always going to match. And when they don't match, friction is going to occur, whether you want it to or not, whether you're, I mean, every developer cares about quality. That absolutely is the case. But if they don't have the time to do it, they might not be able to get as deep as they want, right? So I definitely agree with you that I think there is a lot of actually diplomacy too. I think that's a good way to honestly to define it. Um, but yeah, now getting to the to your other point, who owns it, right? You know, I think a lot of what what I see is is I, I do believe it's a joint adventure, right? For both parties, there has to be that kind of shared responsibility. But at the end of the day, you know, and and what we what we found that worked really well is you really got to have someone responsible for the program. Um, to drive it. Usually that sits within the application security team within the CISO office, uh, somebody who's, who's, who's responsible for monitoring the program, the care and feeding. Hey, do we have enough champions? What was attrition like this past year? Are people progressing through the program the way that we thought? Are we actually getting the return on investment we, we, we anticipated? And then how are we articulating that to the broader stakeholders to get, ensure that we still have this buy-in to, to, to be successful and keep this going? Okay, so that is actually the next thing I wanted to ask about. Like, so I, I've had some clients ask me recently, how do we get buy in for this? Like, we need to write a justification. What do we write about? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I mean, kind of going back to that first thing I said when you build a program, right? You know, you're, you're trying to really understand the, the right goal. And in part of that exercise, you want to go talk, go back to the development team and say, this is what we came up with together with the security team. Do you agree? Do we all agree that this is a problem that is worth fixing? Yes, 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 great. Then let's go to our management and our leadership, the CISOs, the CIOs, the development VPs and managers, and let's go get by in there. Hey, this is what we heard. This is what's happening. This is what we're gonna do to fix it. We need your support. You know, if we're gonna take a champion and we're gonna say, you know, which a champion, let's be honest here, is let's say it's a developer who's already sitting on the development team, and you're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna need. 20% of that person's time now to do champion security stuff, not development, not 120% now, just 20. They're going to have reduced effort from a development standpoint. One, we got to articulate what we're getting out of that quickly. We got to be very good at taking metrics. Um, and we've got to be very clear with their management who's still paying for this and taking the hit on development capacity, why this is important. And I think, you know, kind of really having you know having those conversations because as much as champions in my opinion can really is is kind of formed as a bottom-up initiative in my opinion it's really a top-down one otherwise you're not going to really get the buy-in and the support to continue it and i think after you get that buy-in on that goal that we want to solve on these things you know start with a pilot start small go prove it and then from there i really see buy-in kind of expand and, and go from there that's fantastic. So there's a word that you mentioned that I really liked, metrics. Um, what are some of the, so actually, okay, I'm going to back up from metrics. What are some goals 
that we could have with our program because that's usually one of the metrics I try to think. So like we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. X and so here's how we're getting closer to X. What types of goals could we set? Yeah. So, I mean, again, like, so some of the like, examples that we've run into, right? Um, one program we worked with, um, you know, we were kind of going through that initial exercise. So how is the security process? How is it, you know, with everything? And it kind of came out quickly that um, it took them 380 days on average to remediate a critical vulnerability, which everyone pretty much recognized was unacceptable, right? Everybody. <laughs> Um, so that kind of became the marquee goal slash metric. I mean, fortunately, that mapped pretty nicely, right? Um, for us to kind of go after and help with the champions fixing. So then that kind of get, governed what we figured the champions would do, right? It's like, all right, let's just train them up on to be smart about remediation guidance. Let's, let's get them really, let's make sure that they have time. Um, and people have awareness within teams to really understand that like, this is somebody embedded on your team that can help you, but then make it really easy for that person to go to like a level two support, you know, like the security team, pull in people to help kind of diagnose that problem um, and help kind of just go from 380 days to uh, less. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're like to a number that doesn't horrify us or embarrass us. <laughs> Oh my God. Get hot. Um, I think that I noticed, so I used to run a developer community of practice before I switched into security. And actually that's how I invited one security person, then another, then another, then another, then another. And then before I knew it, everyone's like, why are all of our community of practice talks only about security, Tanya? Um, but I, I remember we did a yearly survey of that they do for the entire department, um, not just IT, but the whole organization. And HR came and said, what have you been doing? I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, IT has had significantly less um, absenteeism, like your the software developers versus the rest, like they're not missing as much work. And like mm. the satisfaction, it's, it's off the charts. Like, I don't know how to say this nicely, but your team's usually like, meh. And they and they miss lots of work, not like an unacceptable amount, but she's like literally like they've missed half as much work on average. And while people went from meh to okay to yeah, I love working here. And she's like, are you, like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, we just get together at lunch. Sometimes I bake cookies and we just learn about cool things like SharePoint and hacking and how to take a run at lunch, but not be the stinky guy in all the meetings in the afternoon. Um, and she's like. Oh, and so I suddenly I got legitimized. The program got legitimized. I, so many more things happened. And so I didn't even think of that as a goal. Just like your idea of reducing friction, that makes people happier to work there. Yeah, but I think the other point that you brought up, which is equally important here, is you built a culture. You know, and, and you built a culture not necessarily by, you know, we're going to have brown bags and we're going to all talk about security. No, we're just going to, eat cookies together and like each other more like it's just that easy right i enjoy showing up because fridays i get to go out watch with my team or you know, brendan brings cookies or we have a beer together after work every now and then it's it's those types of things are, are surprisingly important and i think a lot of times are easy to, to overlook have you seen champions programs result in people being happier at work I mean, that's really interesting. I don't think I've ever, we've ever really paid attention to that quality. And it's definitely a really great idea that I need to need to think a little bit more about in the future. I mean, a lot of what, um, you know, I see and kind of, it's not really the same, I recognize, but like, you know, a lot of times when we do like champion programs, like we'll have like a boot camp, right? So like combining like a little bit of job training with like foundational skills, like Okay, this is how to do a lot of top 10. This is why it's important. This is why you shouldn't let that thing hang for 380 days. And this is like what it actually means to be a champion, right? In our organization and not just generic. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of really pay close attention to um, the popularity of it. So it's like in, a, in six months to a year, do I have a wait list to get into that? Mm -hmm. Like I pay really close attention. And I mean, that's not quite... I think what you were you were saying, but I think it's a, something about like trying to find momentum and excitement. No, I I have a feeling that if you start measuring that, you would see a huge bump. Yeah. 
I, I think you should add that to your metrics. So one other thing that, I, so I have so many questions, Brendan. <laughs> um, so Brendan's run way more security champions programs than I have. And so he has been so generous with his time and letting me just pick his brain and ask him a thousand things. So thank you. Thank what you. about hiring people to the security team from the security champions? Is that something that you've seen for recruiting? Oh, absolutely. I mean, like we don't do this often because obviously we're working with our clients to build um, their programs and train their people up. But, you know, every now and then you get one, you get a few that apply that, to us and we'll hire them, of course, making sure everything's kind of, you know, with, with all of our, uh, you know, agreements with clients, of course, you know, not breaking anything. And we always are pretty transparent. Um, but, you know, it's always kind of cool when you see like someone, you know, a developer, Who's very smart technically on engineering and building and kind of be able to kind of build you know grow this new skill and kind of you know be able to take on new careers i mean it's definitely something that happens right um so i i really like kind of seeing you know that i mean it's, it's clearly one way to build your team and build that skills now you know one common question i i have gotten in the past regarding it is well, okay, uh, we're going to train a lot of people. Like, how is that going to affect attrition, right? How is that going to affect, you know, am I training people to leave? Or am I going to have to replace them? And, and you know, I think, and a lot of, like, my, my answer to that often is, well, one, you always have to take the flip side of that, right? Well, what happens if I don't train them and they stay? You know, we have to protect <laughs> against that. But also we want to build the culture of training and, and elevating people and, and having them go on other things. That's excitement. We have to expect that some group are always going to leave, right? I think in the consulting world, like 12% annual attrition is like the normal um, metric you can expect, right? Like that's the industry benchmark. So, you know, benchmark it yourself, right? You can understand within your own program, is this normal attrition? Is this not? If it is, that's great. We should celebrate people going on to our team taking on bigger security roles maybe elsewhere, taking their taking what we've taught them in our style, our culture somewhere else, that's great. And we should also plan for bringing the next batch, batch of champions in as well. Absolutely. So, okay, so we talked about what were some of the biggest challenges. And I think you mentioned that time commitment was a, could, could be a challenge sometimes. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. Um, so oftentimes what we see is, you know, we'll go in and we'll determine based off of what the champion's going to be responsible for. You know, they're going to be 10%, 20%, 25% time commitment to the program. Um, and and we, we obviously expect some, you know, of, that's an average, right, over time. Um, but also what also happens a lot is, well, they're developers. And, and you know, a busy season happens or the big related release comes up and priorities shift. And I think one thing that we we are cognizant of um, is one we want to allow some of that, right? We want to be we want to be team players at the end of the day, but at the same time, a, a common um, challenge that people really run into early in a champion program is champions will say they're not getting the time committed. Um, and I think a lot of that is sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Yes, like I'm agreeing a wholeheartedly. <laughs> Yeah, and so I think a lot of with champions, it's you've got to one, you have to be getting the visibility into those challenges. Right, you got to be talking to them. You have to have the forums where they can bring that to you. You have to have that trust, and then from there, I think a lot of what I've seen is it's just a an ongoing conversation with, you know, with with um leadership. You have to go back to that top down structure, right? Um, you know, sometimes it's hey. You know, all the leaders we've talked to, here's here's the quarterly metrics. You know, this is what we've seen on a quarterly basis. Um, and this is why this is still important. Let's make sure it's top of mind. People get busy. People get distracted. That's okay. And then sometimes it's, you know, what we've also seen is we've done a great job at the leaders, but we kind of forgot the line managers or the people like the team leads. And we're going to go talk to them too. So in one quick story about that top down, one of my favorite stories to tell is, uh, you know, we're working with this like Fortune 50 company. Um, they had it, we built them a champions program. Their approach was pretty different. It was full time champions, which is not a common thing because they had a they had a big problem with um, security tech backlog and debt. Right, um, it wasn't getting better. They needed a big solution for a big problem. 
um, their global CIO, you know, reporting the CEO, uh, was very engaged in the program, which was a really cool experience to be a part of. Um, and in, in our quarterly, you know, metric review with them session, you know, we had like the champions themselves from the different business units, like presenting their metrics and their challenges and their accomplishments, which was also really cool for the champions to talk to a global CIO, a really important person in this organization to show off their accomplishments. And they're just, you know, like senior developers, right? Um, so, you know, we're talking through this and, and one of the business units was a little behind and, um, you know, the global CIO turned to to that to the VP of this huge business unit and goes, name your champions. Who are your champions? Are you aware of who they actually are? And the person couldn't respond. They didn't know. And the global CIO made the point. All right, next time we do this, you need to know who your champions are. So, you know, that kind of ability needs coming from top down is so important. Oh my gosh. Also on top of that, imagine like the global C CIO knowing your name when you're like a, an intermediate dev. It's like, oh my gosh, hi, hi. <laughs> I love that story. And that brings me to our sponsor, SEMGREF. SEMGREF's supply chain reachability analysis lets you ignore 98% of false positives in open source vulnerabilities and quickly find and fix that 2% that are actually reachable and really matter. You can get your free trial at semgrep.dev slash product slash semgrep dash supply slash chain, or just go to semgrep.dev and just click on the big thing that says supply chain. That's a lot easier. Semgrep also makes a ludicrously fast static analysis tool. They have a free and paid version of the tool, which uses an open source engine and offers additional community related rule set. So you can check out Semgrep code also at semgrep.dev. Awesome. Thank you to them. Brendan, I have, okay. So I really like that story, but I also wanted to hear a bit about, so you talked about, you know, uh, champions having like 10% or 20% of time dedicated to being security champions. What does that look like? Like in a weekly schedule, what does that mean? What, yeah. what do they do? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, the way that I like to kind of look at it is is kind of twofold, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is going to vary per, per program, right? That's and, and it should. Um, it needs to be tailored. A lot of how I look at it is there's tactical things to do every week, and then there's strategic things to do every week. Tactical. Hey, critical showed up on our scan. I got to go look at that, right? I might need to go look at that. I might need to go help someone address that. I might need to go talk to my product manager to make sure that it's prioritized appropriately in our backlog for the next sprint. I got to do some investigating. Is it really a critical, right? Um, and that's the tactical stuff. Um, the strategic stuff is more about like the long-term goals. All right, so one goal that's common is like, we want to do security tool automation better, right? Um, so strategically you know you might want to go spend some time making sure all right we turned on the static analysis tool and there's false positives maybe there's an opportunity to get that to tweak that and obviously that takes time and takes some some you know uh, some tailoring and customization but you know strategically that's a proactive thing that they can spend time on to to improve um results and quality for the development team themselves right so kind of like to look at it from like a tactical and strategic perspective I feel like your strategic perspective really fed into my idea of DevOps where, so they have the three ways of DevOps and the third way is the idea of continuously learning and continuously improving. Yes. And I feel like strategic feeds right into the third way. It's like that, you know, that's nice we fix that critical, but also let's make it so next time we can fix it in half as much time. Yes. Oh, okay. So you and I also talked about motivations of why someone might want to be a champion. Like what are some of the reasons they might want to do that? Yeah. And so I, sorry, one comment on the Dev, DevOps okay. perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I see the DevOps handbook behind you. Yeah. It's somewhere <laughs> over there for me as well. And, and there's a, there's a, 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 like a principle of it that I really like. Obviously the continuous learning is so important. And I think that's a big part of, of a champions program. But the other thing that I really like, and I think really behooves us in the security industry to, to really focus as a North Star is, is the idea of daily work. You know, developers are always so, they're already good about keeping like bugs, fixes and debugging as part of their daily work. I forget a semicolon, I get a compiler error, I go fix it right there. 
And I think security, we're getting there, we're getting better as an industry, but I still think there's opportunities for us to, um, you know, really get what we do and the solutions we provide um, as, as easy as part of the daily work of a developer. And I, I think like, you know, a lot of this, I, you know, you know, I'm kind of honestly um, stealing a little bit from Google's like tri-quarter research. Their stuff is amazing. If you haven't read the the, the research papers, I definitely recommend it. Because I think they have a, you know, the first research paper is what, 2015. I think the, they had a follow-up in 2018. Um, even though that, you know, it's 2023, I still think a lot of the principles that they've applied within their development process really, you know, I think we a lot of us can learn from in the industry. Yes. Oh my gosh, taking time to improve our daily work is so important and it's it's like an investment in your own job in the future. But I wanted to go back to motivations. Why would someone want to become a security champion? Because I am a, I am a giant nerd, obviously. I know why I would want to. I just got very excited and curious, but there's more reasons than just Tanya being curious that people would want to be a champion. No, you're not, yeah, no, I get it. Uh, um... You know, it's easy for us to say we're we're obviously very excited about security, right? So, um, you know, but I think I think a lot of it is, you know, I, I kind of go back to, to what I said earlier. Developers care about quality, right? And this is an aspect of quality that often isn't really taught as well as it could have been in you know in com you know, computer science programs and computer engineering programs. I know for me, you know, I have a CS background, but. You know, we didn't have any security classes. I had to do an independent study where I literally had, you know, did a pen test of our department's, you know, website. <laughs> and like, that was a great experience to kind of learn about it and actually like spend time getting better at it. I, you know, I think one, it's a it's a way to kind of, you know, sharpen your, your, your tools and your skills on quality, all things quality, right? It's obviously an important thing that'll keep you out of the news. Um, but I also think it's, you know, it's a way to grow your skills. It's a way to kind of open, um, open doors, depending on where you want to go with your career, having a very skilled security engineer, or just a, really an engineer, not necessarily a security engineer, but an engineer engineer that has security skills will make you very valuable. Um, or you can even pivot into the security industry if that's what you want to do as well. So I think there's opportunities there. Um, but also, more importantly, you're going to help your team be better, you know, have a better quality product, improve the life of your development team and, and try to kind of um, help solve that problem too from a process perspective. I want to add on to that. A thing that I think sometimes people don't, they don't always think about it, but a lot of us have this drive inside of us to do good things with our lives. So I, I don't mean, um, uh, you know, poor grammar, like I did good. I mean, like Superman performs good, he, like he, his character does good within the world. And it, it, I don't know if this sounds cheesy, but when I perform security work and I fix a big bug or I, I do a thing, I think of myself as protecting people, like protecting our customers, protecting my coworkers, protecting the public in general and being like, I'm doing a good job. I just protected you from this. Do you feel like that might be a way that we could help motivate some of them to join, like be a hero, protect our org? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, no, I definitely think that's a good way to kind of, you know, articulate the motivation. I do think that, you know, part of it also is, I, I don't know how to say this perfectly, so bear with me here. But I, I think that, you know, a lot of times, yeah, I feel like there's two ways to approach this, right? Because I, I think there, there's a lot of very intelligent developers out there that, that have a lot of engineering skills um, and, 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 are, and are very good at what they do, um, but sometimes don't know the full impact of really that issue the security team keeps calling them about. And understand, we can't be an expert in everything. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think, you know, there is an awareness aspect, I think, too, of champion programs. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm kind of diverting a little bit from the no, question, no, but bear with me here. You know, I think that, you know, one thing that we see when we do initial programs is even if we say, all right, these are our goals, we're going to do more SaaS, we're going to do more DAS, we're going to do more, more, whatever. And um, what we'll see, though, is after we get through the training where we actually go, okay, this is really what a cross-site scripting is. This is, how can, this is how an attacker thinks. This is how they would, might exploit it. This is how you protect against this and the, all the other OWASP top 10, et cetera. Um, 
you start seeing a change in mentality often where all of a sudden issues start getting fixed faster and the tech deck kind of starts going down faster. And, and a lot of my theory around that is because, you know, you, you really started, you really provided some of the education that other people have failed to provide in the past to these engineers that are now taking, they're like, oh, wait, that's what that can do. That's the impact. Uh oh, yeah, we can't push that off anymore. We're going to go fix it now. And then they start driving that culture change and, and momentum and excitement, honestly, you know, internally from the bottom up. And, and I think that, you know, to kind of factor in that motivation, I'm kind of taking it a stretch, the answer, but, you know, I think that, you know, part of that is, 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 you know, now they have the tools and the means to really do good, the Superman, as you said. Um, and I, I think people get really excited about it because ultimately they do care about the quality of the product that they're they're spending a lot of their time on. Yes. No, that was a great answer. Um, okay, so I want to switch gears for just a second, or actually as long as you want. Um, but what does a good security champions program look like? I think it's it's pretty obvious what a bad one looks like. Oh, you never talk to them, nothing happens, like you haven't trained them, they don't know what to do. But what does it what does a good program look like? Yeah, a, a good program is one where you have a good understanding of the shared goals and responsibility you're trying to solve. You have a good way to measure the impact and the metrics of that. So you can course correct, you can articulate the value, you can get the right reading on the health of the program that you can strategically change proactively. Mm -hmm. um, a program where they're building strong relationships between developers and security people where you are you are achieving this goal, identifying new goals based off of your 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 more embedded and great you know integrated um lifestyle culture lifestyle. Yeah. You know, you're you're changing the culture day by day through something like this and and really making security um you know putting for as cheesy as it sounds, right? You're putting the, the SEC in DevSecOps, right? You're actually doing that and seeing results on it is really what I think the, the hallmarks of a, a successful program are. That's awesome. That is awesome. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask one more question because <laughs> I'll go on and on, Brendan, if you let me. Um, so how can we, so this is a two-part question. Yeah, I'm just going to smash two questions together and call it one. <laughs> so how do we motivate people to become security champions? And how do we kind of find them or recruit them or attract them? Like, how do we do that? Yeah. Um, so I, I'll start with the second question um, okay. or the second part of your one question. <laughs> um, you know, how do we find people, right? I mean, the reality is, is, I mean, anyone running a security program today knows that there are certain dev teams that they already have a relationship with. They already know that, hey, this team is easy to work with. That's a common question that comes up. It's like, all right, we're going to do a pilot to prove this before we scale, which pilots are great because, you know, you have early adopters. You go work with the early adopters, and then you have success stories to get the late adopters on board. Um, but, you know, every single time someone's asking, well, who's a good candidate for a pilot team? I go, well... You know, when I ask you, hey, what teams are easy to work with right now? What teams do you already go to for feedback? You already have someone in mind. That's the that's the pilot group. Those are the people you work with first. Um, and, and you look to get those success stories so you get the rest. Some people are going to drag their feet. Some people are going to be more careful and, 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 and conservative about coming into this because they are giving up resources. That's okay. Let's win them over. Um, let's show off the success and the metrics and the success um, and have them sell for you internally. Um, that's way more powerful than you going and be like, hey, this is important. I'm a security team. I say it's important. Uh, it's better when the development team goes, actually, they're, they're onto something. Um, and then from a motivation perspective, you know, I think, you know, the way I like to look at it is, uh, and I actually wrote a recent LinkedIn or two LinkedIn posts on this. Um, you know, it is really the key. Show notes? Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll send you a link to those so we can put those in there. Definitely. And anyone reading it um, would love feedback or, or examples of how you've seen it or work or not work. Um, but really what I what I 
how I kind of like to look at motivation is twofold, right? One is career advancement and progression. And then the other one is, is mon mon money, right? <laughs> Monetary rewards. You know, we, we have bonuses for a reason, right? Um, we work to get a paycheck often, right? So, you know, we don't want to ignore that either, right? And then, so what I really mean by those two things are career advancement are, you know, learning new skills, gaining experience in certain things, um, gaining opportunity to, to advance what I do and get better at what I do, to put myself in a position for a promotion, um, the next job I'm looking for. And champion programs can do that. Go get trained up on these certain things. Go start getting, um, you know, experience thinking from a security perspective. Those skills are easily translatable to either a more senior, you know, distinguished engineer perspective, a security engineer perspective, or someone on the security team. Um, and also kind of the awareness that kind of comes from that program where, you know, you might be a senior developer talking to a global CIO, right? That, that, that helps. Um, that looks really nice on your end of the year performance review, which then kind of, you know, segues into the second part about it. You know, how can we make this from a, how can we reward people monetarily for the good work they do? You know, I, I find that it's really impactful to, you know, for your champions, you know, work with HR and managers to actually get success in the champion program to be a contributor to their end of the year bonus or their, their annual merit increase. You know, those types of things matter. Have you ever done, um, so, so sometimes you're, you don't work at a place where there's bonuses, but where you give them other things like public recognition, or maybe like little gifts, like buying them some security books or a UB key. I'm probably not supposed to name products specifically, but that's like one I've just seen a lot. Um, is, have you ever seen anything like that work? Like giving them gifts, like recognizing or rewarding them, but not yeah. with like cash? Yeah, definitely. So, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, free, free things you can do are, you know, newsletter where you recognize people um, and where you make sure that the senior people are CC'd on, um, you know, more people like senior people in your program, you can, you know, set up like, a, you know, a lunch with the CISO, right? You know, giving them access to these, these people so they can share their ideas, right? They're going to come to you with a lot of ideas and feedback. You know, the most senior experienced ones, We'll give them the opportunity where they can go tell that to the CISO and actually make an impact, right? Or have their voice heard, right? To get the stage. And um, so I've seen things like that. I've seen things like conference fees. I see things like you can kind of see it. I'm not going to zoom in on it because it might be a client name on it, but like challenge coins even as they kind of go through different gamification levels. Oh my gosh, I love that. You had told me about the challenge coins idea, which I totally love. And lunch with the CISO that's so that's such a cool idea that's funny because like when I first joined my first security team at one point the deputy security officer brought me for lunch and I was like oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh <laughs> and it really yeah it, it 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 did the thing it was supposed to do where I was just like oh I love my new team like I was just so dazzled and he told me all these cool stories about how he like jumped out of an airplane in like a war zone and like all those cool things that he'd done. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I get to work for this amazing human being. Oh, that's so smart, Brendan. Oh, okay. So I, uh, I, so folks, I would talk to Brendan for three weeks if he'd let me, um, but we do have to come to the end of the show at some point. Brendan, if people want to read your work and people want to connect with you or be able to follow all the cool stuff you're doing, how can they do this? Yeah, so uh, the, the two major places, uh, one synopsis, you know, in our software integrity group, we have an application security blog. So I highly recommend people take a look at that. Um, my my cloud security container, AIML team, they do a lot of uh, thought leadership on there. So definitely highly recommend looking at that. Same with champions um, as well. So there's some good content there. Um, I think you can find that at you know, synopsis.com slash blogs slash software hyphen security. Um, and then also check out my LinkedIn. I, I try to post something weekly um, and a lot of the past content has been security champion related. So you know, those are two good places. And then finally, you know, please reach out on LinkedIn. You know, happy to have conversations one-on-one -on -one with what you're dealing with in your program. Happy to, to share ideas, thoughts, and um, comments. So I can attest to his friendliness. He's so nice. 
And I, he let me ask him a, a ton of questions and he manages lots of security champions programs still. So if you need someone to help you with that, he might be a person that does that. Um, <laughs> we're totally not doing sales, but maybe a little bit. Um, so, uh, oh my gosh, Brendan, this has been amazing. And I really want, so if you are listening or watching, uh, if you go to wehackpurple.com slash podcast, you'll be able to find Brendan and there'll be a picture and it's going to look just like him. And there's going to be show notes and I'm going to have a link to these blog posts that he put on LinkedIn. I'm going to have a link to the synopsis blog and I'm going to have a link to his LinkedIn so that you can connect with him. Oh, Brendan, this has been so great. Thank you so much for being on the show and thank you, Semgrat, for sponsoring. Brendan, it has been such a, an utter pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Tanya, thank you very much for having me on as well. I really enjoyed uh, our conversations uh, during this and also leading up to it as well. So thanks. Awesome. Everyone from We Hack Purple, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next time.